Welcome to Photograph Preservation, Module 4 of 7, Part 2, Emergency Salvage. Emergency. A serious, unexpected, and often dangerous situation requiring immediate action. Sometimes emergencies aren't truly unexpected. If the river is rising due to heavy rain, we can expect low-lying areas and buildings to flood. Other emergencies are things we know might happen, but don't know when and really hope that they won't. People who work in emergency planning put a great deal of thought into expecting these unwelcome events that disrupt our everyday existence and figuring out how to respond effectively to these situations to minimize the damage caused. Typically, the terms emergency preparedness and emergency response are preferred to variations that use disaster. This is because a disaster is often considered to be an emergency that exceeds the resources available to respond to it. Whether you're facing an emergency, a disaster, or just want to be prepared, hopefully this presentation will help you recover any photographic materials affected. When it comes to addressing the damage to photographic materials caused by emergencies, prevention remains the best option. It's always better, better to prevent damage from happening than to fix things after the damage has already happened. Photographic materials, indeed any important items, should not be stored where emergencies are most likely to occur. Many emergencies are limited to a small area within a building so avoiding proximity to the source and cause of the emergency matters. In addition to all the other good reasons for not storing photographs in basements, the lowest levels of a building are the most likely to flood. When a flood or leak doesn't happen, having things raised off the floor by storing them on shelves or in cupboards is often enough to keep them out of the water. Similarly, it's a good idea not to keep things directly under pipes, which could potentially leak or break, and away from sources of combustion. Of course, not all emergencies are limited. Sometimes a flood, fire, or severe wet weather event engulfs a whole building and everything in it, so salvage techniques are important too. Emergencies are often dangerous. The things that cause sudden harm to photographic materials often pose risks to us too. Frequent hazards of emergency incidents include scrapes and cuts, slips and falls, infections, bites, burns, and electrocution. Protecting the lives and health of people affected by the emergency comes first. People are more important than things. Stay safe, then rescue your stuff even when it's really important stuff. If the situation was severe enough for emergency services to be called, get their approval, and if necessary, consult a structural engineer or other appropriate professional before entering the area. And make sure there are no sources of electricity in contact with water or any wet materials. Wear appropriate personal protective equipment to reduce your risk of injury or illness and have first aid supplies available. Work with a buddy, plan your course of action, and don't rush. Prompt action is important, but rushing can lead to mistakes and injuries. Look first. If animals, insects, or sharp-edged debris may be present, don't reach into any area where you can't see. When we talked about remedial conservation, our focus was on evaluating the risks posed by a treatment and making thoughtful decisions that balance those risks against the existing damage and ongoing decay processes already affecting the photographic materials. Emergencies often cause such severe and fast acting damage, especially to photographic materials that the risks of not treating the damage are massive compared to the treatment risks. Almost any treatment becomes preferable to doing nothing at all, because salvaging something, even with unmitigated damage, is better than salvaging nothing. 
The key here is almost, because different photographic processes have different needs. We're going to review the best available first response techniques for various types of photographs and some basic methods for salvaging photographic materials damaged in an emergency. Most collection emergencies include unwanted exposure of things in the collection to water. In addition to the obvious floods, leaks, and storms, this includes emergencies like fires, where water is the typical extinguishing agent, and earthquakes, which may cause broken pipes. Many photographic formats, especially the early historic processes, are unfortunately very sensitive to water. Colors may bleed or transfer, emulsions may swell, distort, or slide off their support material entirely. The Atlas of Water Damage, published by the Image Permanence Institute, shows examples of different kinds of damage that may happen as a result of water exposure. While focused on inkjet fine art prints, it provides examples and useful vocabulary to describe water damaged photographic materials generally, something that may come in handy if you're trying to discuss your damaged photographs with a conservator or understand a pretreatment condition report. Some photographic formats are very sensitive to water. Severe deterioration begins as soon as water contact occurs and may proceed quite rapidly. For these, it's best to use protective housing or store these items together to make immediate salvage easier. The most water sensitive formats, dye transfer prints and additive color transparencies like autochromes have very poor recovery rates, even with prompt treatment. They should have waterproof outer packaging when in storage, such as placing the archival box in a sealed plastic container, or wrapping the box in several layers of plastic and sealing all the seams with tape. Several other historic formats, including most with glass or metal supports, are also very water sensitive and should be dried immediately if exposed to water or moisture. Even with immediate attention, these formats may have a lot of untreatable damage post-emergency. This includes cased photographs, uncased daguerreotypes and tintypes, wet collodion glass plates, wood buried types and carbon prints, and deteriorated nitrate and acetate film. As a final note, nitrate film is a fire hazard, especially deteriorated nitrate. Mildly deteriorated nitrates can be stored with suitable precautions, but more severely deteriorated instances should be safely disposed of through your local fire department or hazardous waste collection event. When organic materials such as paper, gelatin, and other components of photographic materials get wet or damp, mold growth becomes a major risk. Mold can start growing on wet materials in as little as two or three days. To minimize mold growth, we want to stay out of the danger zone. That is temperatures above 70 degrees and relative humidity above 70%. Reducing the temperature and humidity creates less favorable conditions for mold growth. Good air circulation will also help reduce the humidity and discourage mold growth. Tin types and other metal plate photographs need even lower humidity to prevent corrosion, generally no more than 55% RH. It's also important to remove water from the emergency incident scene, shut off or redirect water sources, and pump out or mop up standing water. Damaged items should be dried or frozen before mold growth begins, typically 48 to 72 hours. However, after major incidents, it may not be possible to access the area and items needing attention for much longer periods of time. Unfortunately, mold is incredibly hard to kill. The methods that can kill mold, like incineration and bleach, aren't safe for photographic materials, at least not ones we want to keep. The best we can hope for is dormancy where the mold stops growing and becomes a dry, powdery mess instead of a wet, smeary menace. 
that wet smeary mold can be inactivated or sent into a dormant state by freezing, exposure to sunlight, and ethanol. It's important to only use methods that are safe for a particular photographic format. If your photographs aren't on the do not freeze list, your best choice is to pop them in a super cold freezer for a few weeks. Otherwise, you can dry them in the sun, remembering that sunlight will also cause fading and accelerated aging, or after careful testing in an inconspicuous corner, spray them with a mixture of 70% ethanol and 30% purified water before drying. Once the mold is inactive, you will need to clean off as much of the dormant mold spores as possible. A smoke sponge can be used to dab or brush off small amounts of mold. Be sure to trim off and discard used sections of the sponge regularly. Larger amounts of mold should be vacuumed off as explained in the next slide. In addition to threatening photographic materials and other things, Mold is also a health hazard to people. This means it's important to wear appropriate personal protective equipment, PPE. At a minimum, this should include a respirator with at least an N95 or equivalent rating and gloves to keep mold spores out of your lungs and off your skin. Goggles or safety glasses will help protect your eyes. It's also a good idea to cover your clothes with an apron or clean suit change clothes after you're done working, and wash the clothes you were wearing thoroughly in the hottest water they can stand. This procedure is for vacuuming inactive mold spores off photographs and other flat items like these two photos. Remember, mold is a health hazard. Be sure to wear your PPE and use a vacuum with a HEPA filter, which will trap the mold spores and prevent them from being expelled into the air with the vacuum exhaust. It's also better to use a vacuum with a disposable bag or other receptacle for collecting the dust so you can avoid dispersing mold spores when emptying the vacuum. If the only vacuum you have available is bagless, be sure to empty it outside while wearing your PPE. Place the moldy item to be vacuumed on a work surface covered with something disposable like unprinted newsprint, blotters, or a plastic tablecloth. If the item is fragile, cover it with a section of window screening. This will help prevent any loose bits from getting vacuumed up. Hold the vacuum nozzle at a shallow angle to the photograph to vacuum through the screen. Or without the screen, use a soft brush to direct the mold towards the vacuum nozzle. Don't apply the vacuum nozzle directly to the photograph. And here's the other photograph getting its turn. Once you've cleaned your, all your moldy items, be sure to safely dispose of the vacuum contents and thoroughly wash or dispose of all mold contaminated materials, including your clothing. And finally, we have our clean photos. They still have some staining from the mold and could benefit from further treatment by a conservator, but are in much better shape than when we started. One of the best ways to stop mold growth from occurring, inactivate mold that is already growing, and safely delay the treatment of damaged items while you deal with the rest of the emergency, is to freeze wet at-risk items. However, not all photographic materials can be frozen safely. The basic rule is do not freeze anything with a metal or glass support. Specifically, do not freeze 
cased photographs, daguerreotypes or tintypes, wet collodion glass plate negatives, and color transparencies on glass. Freezing deteriorated nitrates and acetates is considered experimental. It might work, but there's still a lot of uncertainty about the practice. Things that cannot be frozen should be air dried immediately. Film in good condition and a few print processes can be stored wet for short periods. If allowed to dry in contact with other materials, blocking will occur where the films or prints adhere to themselves or each other. By keeping them wet for short periods, until they can be properly treated, blocking is prevented. Unlike freezing, this isn't an indefinite storage method. Wet time should be minimized as much as possible. However, this technique can help get you past the first part of the emergency and allow you to make arrangements for treatment or freezing. This procedure is only for things that are already wet. Motion pictures in cans and other items in water-resistant housing should be checked first. If the inside of the housing and the film or photographs is dry, simply wipe off the outside and relabel if necessary. The photographic formats where wet storage is generally advised are silver gelatin, developing out paper, and printing out paper prints chromogenic prints, negatives, and color transparencies, gelatin dry plate glass negatives, polyester film, nitrate and acetate film in good condition, mounted slides and sheet films, motion picture film, and microfilm and microfiche. Things that are wet start by gently rinsing off any dirt or debris with clean water. A soft brush can be used on stable emulsions. Remove the film from any sleeve or mount if possible. Place wet film or prints in resealable plastic bags, in boxes triple lined with plastic bags, or in plastic tubs with clean water. Motion pictures and microfilm reels should be sent to a film processor to be washed and redried. Seal each bag tightly and be sure the box is labeled as wet film. Other types of materials should be air dried or frozen, then thawed and air dried in small batches as time and space permit. When it comes to drying things out, there are two main options, air drying and vacuum freeze drying. Air drying is the process of drying things in the open air at room temperature by spreading them out on flat surfaces or hanging them on lines. It's easy to do and requires only relatively cheap, easy to get materials and can be, therefore be done at home. However, it's time consuming as wet photographs may dry slowly, requires a lot of space and requires a lot of work to spread everything out and make sure it dries properly. It tends to result in planar distortion. In other words, air dried things usually don't dry flat although this is a problem that can often be corrected later. Air drying is generally the best choice for small quantities of materials. If you've frozen damaged items to inactivate mold or gain time, they can be thawed in small batches for air drying. Vacuum freeze drying uses a vacuum chamber maintained at temperatures below freezing to dry previously frozen materials by sublimation a process where the moisture goes directly from solid ice to water vapor and skips the liquid phase. This method typically results in less planar distortion and other damage to the materials being dried. It's a good choice if you have a lot of materials that need drying. It generally can't be done at home because the equipment is bulky and expensive. Even small versions intended for home use to freeze dry food cost a few thousand dollars. So unless you have a vacuum freeze dryer on hand, you'll need to hire a specialist company to dry your photographs this way. Beware of companies offering thermal vacuum drying, where items are dried in a vacuum chamber above freezing. This method exposes items to liquid water during the drying process and therefore doesn't protect them from blocking and planar distortion. 
Additionally, the heat used may cause accelerated aging of your photographs. Air dry photographs. Start by preparing a drying space. In this case, an empty conference room, as it provides the two essentials, flat work surfaces and an area where the temperature and humidity can be controlled. Remember, you want to stay out of the danger zone by maintaining temperatures below 70 degrees and humidity below 70% to prevent mold or 55% to prevent metal corrosion. You'll also need to maintain good air circulation throughout the space. This will help prevent mold growth and facilitate drying. If possible, run multiple fans, position them below the level of the work surfaces, or use small weights placed on the edges of drying items to prevent them from blowing around. Cover the drying surfaces with pieces of blotters, a kind of thick absorbent paper, with unprinted newsprint or paper towels, or with other clean absorbent material. Use pieces that are a good size to be easily changed out when they get damp under specific items. If you are using newsprint or paper towels, it's very important to use unprinted sheets so there's no transfer of ink or dye to the photographic materials. Then cover at least some of the blotters with a non-stick barrier. This is important for drying items that have a coating and therefore potentially sticky surfaces on both sides. Non-woven polyester fabric is ideal for this as it generally won't stick to the photographic emulsions but readily allows the passage of moisture. It's available from conservation suppliers as Holotex or Rime, or you can use interfacing fabric from fabric supply stores. Be sure to get the sew-in kind without adhesive, not the fusible or iron in. Silicone coated parchment paper, like for baking, can also be used, although it's more impermeable to moisture and will cause slower drying. You can also ha string hanging lines, which are particularly good for drying film using thin clothesline. When you have your air drying space prepared, it's time to start drying your wet photographic materials. Detailed instructions for this procedure, with any necessary variations for the different photographic processes, are also found in the guides listed on the resource page at the end. If you are drying things that were frozen, Allow them to thaw completely before you start. Make sure they stay wet while thawing so they don't dry stuck together. Here, we're starting with items from a staged flood. Separate the wet photographs and remove them from any enclosure or housing. You can apply gentle force to peel them apart or use a thin spatula or similar tool to slip between the adhered items. The idea with the spatula is to push it horizontally between the adhered items, keeping them as flat as possible and working through the adhesion from the side, rather than applying mainly upward force that may pull the layers of the photograph apart. If things do start to tear or delaminate, stop. It is sometimes possible to successfully separate the items from the other side of the adhesion while keeping the tear or delamination from getting worse. However, in many cases, these items will need professional care for successful separation with minimal post-treatment damage. Keep all fully detached fragments together with a label indicating which photograph they are from. If the photographic materials are dirty, they should usually be rinsed gently in clean, cool water. A soft brush or cotton balls can be used to dislodge adhered dirt and debris, but should be used carefully to avoid damaging the emulsion layer. Use several trays or other containers with successively cleaner water to rinse the photographs. Do not attempt to rinse items that are sooty. These should be handled as little as possible and cleaned when dry. Items that are fragile or particularly water sensitive should be sent to a conservator. Once you have your items clean and separated, spread them in a single layer on the prepared drying surface 
or hang them from the drying line, spaced to prevent touching. Items with water-sensitive coatings on both sides should be placed on polyester webbing or hung. Change the blotters as they become damp or wet to facilitate drying. Your emergency may be bigger than you can handle on your own. Fortunately, there are professionals who can help. The American Institute for Conservation, the major professional organization for conservators in the United States, has information on how to hire a conservator and a searchable directory of conservation professionals. You may need to work with your insurance company as well if your policy includes coverage for the repair or replacement of damaged possessions. If you missed it, Module 4, Part 1 of this series covers what conservators can and can't do to address common conservation problems. Depending on the scale and scope of the emergency, you may want to hire an emergency recovery firm. These firms typically offer a variety of services to assist with post-fire, post-flood, or other emergency recovery. Some emergency recovery firms, including BMS CAD, Belfour, and Polygon, have in-house conservation labs and include document and media restoration in their services, although these may have minimum job size requirements. Whatever professional services you are considering, be sure to ask questions, consider your choices, and get a written agreement. One of the best resources for recovering not just photographic materials, but also documents, audiovisual materials, computer disks, and art is the Salvage at a Glance Guide by Betty Walsh. It's available for free as a PDF from Archives Canada and has been widely published in print and online. Guidance specific to salvaging wet photographic materials is also available from the Northeast Document Conservation Center and the Image Permanence Institute. Links are available in the description for this video. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something useful about emergency salvage today and also that you have as few emergencies as possible. Stay tuned for Module 5 of our Photograph Preservation Workshop, which covers color photography.